Historical Footprints is proud to present a series of Black Hills programs that will take you from the top of Mount Rushmore to the bottom of the great Homestake Gold Mine, 8,000 feet deep. Each program is full of historic photos, one-of-a-kind historic film footage, interviews with leading Black Hills historians, and reenactments of many historical events that brings to the viewer an honest, straightforward look at the real history of the Black Hills. The first, of course, is Deadwood, the myth, legend, and reality. Deadwood is the gold camp that just would not die. If you've ever seen Deadwood on HBO, this is the program that will give you the real facts on which a legend was born. For over a century, Deadwood and the people who have lived here have had one great adventure after another. Deadwood's characters and its stories have created their share of legends and tall tales. Separating Deadwood's truth from its fiction is a real challenge, and often the tall tales get the best of the truth. But when it comes to legends, a good story is always better than the truth. Or is it? Martha. Calamity Jane Canary Burke gave rise to her share of Deadwood legends. Various biographies of Jane have only created a mass of confusion about her early life. Facts about her birthplace, family, education, and early life have never been positively established. After making it to Deadwood with the same group that included Wild Bill, Jane worked as a prostitute. Jane learned telling a good Western story to Eastern newspaper men was worth money. So long after Wild Bill was dead and could not defend himself, Jane told a story of romance between the two. Writers turned out articles, books, and dime novels on the pair. In 1915, the Hart brothers of Lincoln, Nebraska, produced the first full-length silent movie called The Days of 75-76 with Wild Bill winning the affection of Calamity Jane. Filmmakers made the most of a strong frontier woman in love with a fast gun lawman. Only in this movie, Jack McCall has been elevated to a role where he vies for Jane's affection. Of course, the wagon train is attacked. Wild Bill goes for help. He staggers into a cavalry camp of 1876. However, the uniforms are pre-World War I vintage, and the hats and leggings are a dead giveaway. This is a great film that takes amazing liberties with historic facts, but ends in true Western fashion with Calamity Jane weeping at the grave of Wild Bill. Jane was noted for helping the miners when they were sick. She did spend most of her later years drunk and destitute, drifting in and out of Deadwood until her death in the nearby mining camp of Terry, August 1st, 1903. One fact is certain, Jane was never married to Wild Bill, as she repeatedly claimed in later years. Married or not, Jane was buried next to Hickok, as she requested. History of mining reminds us the quest for precious metal is what opened the region and follows the growth of the industry for over 125 years. You will discover gold was only one of the many minerals that brought wealth to the hard rock miner. The equipment used is much the same as used in the development phase. Either jack leg or the jumbo drill is used to drill holes from one and a quarter inches to one and a half inches in size in the mechanized cut and fill stope walls. The holes are then loaded, blasted, and the rock hauled to the nearest ore dump. The diesel-powered LHDs have a capacity of two to three and a half yards of rock. Any oversized rock that reaches the dump is broken with a hydraulic rock pick, allowing the rock to move easily through the ore pass. The ore falls to the next level, where it is loaded into five-ton rail cars for transport to the ore dump. From there, it is hoisted to the surface for grinding and processing. The VCR method of mining is much the same, but this bulk mining method uses a down-the-hole drill.
These units drill holes six and a half inches in diameter down the full length of the ore body. Blasting then takes 10 foot vertical lifts or slices working from the bottom up. Again, the broken ore is removed by LHDs. Oftentimes, for safety purposes, the LHDs are operated by radio remote control to protect the operator from any loose rock that might be overhead. After the mine rock has passed through the surface milling process, the end product is a doré bullion. This doré bullion is further refined to remove the silver and metals producing gold that is at least 99.8% pure. For every six to seven tons of ore processed, one ounce of gold is obtained. Silver is a valuable co-product. The surface of each bar is heated as the gold starts to cool to prevent contraction and allows for a smooth, even surface. The bars, weighing about 400 ounces, are then cooled by being quenched in cold water. After this process, the gold bars are buffed, weighed, and stamped. Gambling in the Old West was a part of everyday life for most people. The soldiers, the cowboys, and the miners well, they all gamble to help use up the time out here in the remote regions of a new nation. From West Texas to California and up to Montana and here in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, the stories of fortunes won and lost at the turn of a card abound. But to really tell the history of gambling in Deadwood, we've got to go back to the year 1876. They came in wagon trains and rode on horseback. They braved the long winters and Indian attacks. They found gold in the gulch of the fallen dead wood. And that's how the town got its name. Deadwood, South Dakota. and lawlessness and calamity to Jane. Preacher Smith read the Bible, his last sermon was in vain. Someone shot and killed him the very next day, and he died with his Bible in his hand. Deadwood, South Dakota, Deadwood is a name. In saloon number 10, Jack McCall got his revenge, and he sent while Bill to his doom. She had a gambling husband, and she got tired of it, and she went into a bar where he was playing poker, and nobody would say ah, yes or no, because this was just unheard of. And she walked up to the table where there was a huge stack of chips and gold and checks and currency, and she took her apron in one hand and her hand in the other, and she swept all that uh, uh, pot right off into her apron and walked out. And her husband followed kind of sheepishly, and nobody would ever play poker with him again. And it's the only instance on record where a wife has been able to reform a gambling husband. Four gigantic presidential figures carved on South Dakota's Mount Rushmore by sculptor Gutson Borglum constitute one of the sculptural wonders of the world. But in the beginning, uh, it was just an idea, and a really silly idea at that, to carve a monument in the mountain wilderness of a remote state with a population less than that of a modest-sized city and with not one paved road across it. And on top of that, in the beginning, presidents were not the intended subject, Rushmore was not the intended mountain, and Gutson Borglum was not the intended sculptor. First, there was the matter of reaching carvable granite, dynamiting away excess stone. These guys that were doing, using the dynamite, they had used it a lot, and especially this one old fella. But when you got up there where 
where you were just blasting around the uh, scaffolds and stuff, and you didn't want to take them down, and they, they would take that uh, round dynamite and wrap a, and put an electric cap in it and then tie it, and uh, then we then they were always the holes were always tamped with Sam so that uh, you the full force. This one fellow was so good he could set them charges off and never hit a thing. To set dynamite charges and for other tasks, workers were hoisted over the cliff in sling seats. Going down was never a problem because you, uh, you, you were just going along and as the cable went out, you had to go or else. But I'll tell you, when you tried to come back up at first, you, couldn't, you didn't trust that cable. You just didn't think, and you instead of rearing back and getting your feet rigid like they should be, you had a tendency to lean forward, and if you didn't watch it, pretty soon they'd have you right on your face, just dragging you right up there. A few glances at Mount Moriah Cemetery should convince you that this is a very unique place. Old tombstones, those shady ponderosa pines, and even statues of the dearly departed make this a very special place here on the slopes of Deadwood Gulch stop and realize how many citizens are resting here on these slopes. Any visitor to Deadwood finds out it's a must to go to Mount Moriah. But aside from the remains of Wild Bill Hickok and Martha Calamity Jane Canary Burke and a few other notorious denizens of Deadwood Gulf, what else is there to see at Mount Moriah? <laughs> well, you know, you might be surprised. Seth Bullock, popularly remembered as Deadwood's first sheriff, was here from the time he arrived in 1876 until he died in 1919, the golden era of Deadwood. He fled a domineering and rigid father in Canada to go to the Montana gold fields where he learned the ways of the miner and the lawman. When the Black Hills rush began, Seth Bullock joined a number of his fellow Montanans in the journey to the new bonanza. He was convinced that there was more money in serving miners than panning for gold. With his partner, Saul Starr, Bullock arrived in Deadwood in the summer of 1876, prepared to enter the hardware business since he had served as Sheriff of Lewis and Clark County in the Montana Territory. Bullock was appointed Lawrence County's first sheriff when the county was organized. As a member of a committee on sanitation appointed to clean up Deadwood Gulch in the summer of 1876, Bullock accepted the task of overseeing the burial of Preacher Smith, whom he didn't know personally, and writing to Smith's family in Kentucky. The firm of Starr and Bullock did well, and soon Seth's investments included a hotel, a ranch, and several mining ventures. He volunteered to serve in the Spanish-American War. By that time, Bullock included among friends future President Theodore Roosevelt. The two had met during one of Roosevelt's trips to his cattle ranch, in the North Dakota Badlands, and they became fast friends. Years later, when Roosevelt was president, he sent his sons to Deadwood to stay with Seth and hunt and fish in the Black Hills. Bullock's friendship with Roosevelt lasted to the end of their lives. Roosevelt once called Bullock, my ideal, typical American. After Teddy's death in January 1919, a saddened Bullock in poor health himself, worked to build Teddy's monument on a Black Hills peak named Mount Roosevelt and Seth lived just long enough to dedicate it. Deadwood's pioneer, businessman, lawman, innkeeper, mining promoter, soldier, and politician died in the fall of 1919. Seth rests on a plot just up the hill above Mount Moriah, offering him a view of Mount Roosevelt. As a man of many talents and interests, Bullock enjoyed a busy career. Before we move on to the development stage, let's take a look at how the Homestake Mine is laid out. Two 5,000-foot production shafts provide access to the underground mine. These shafts, the Ross and the Yates, are used to lower men and equipment into the mine and also serve to hoist or skip the ore out of the mine. 
An elevator, or cage as it's called in the mining industry, transports men and equipment. Communication between the cager and the hoist engineer is provided by a radio system. One three, one three, hoist. Three one. Three one. Hoist. A signal bell system is also used to communicate hoisting instructions. Hoist rooms, located on the surface, house Norberg double drum hoists grooved to wind 5,600 feet of 1 and 7 eighths wire rope on a single wrap drum. These hoists control cages or skips in separate shaft compartments. The cages and skips are counterbalanced. When one goes up, the other goes down. The hoist operator can take the workers to the bottom of each shaft, which is located at a depth of 4,850 feet. Mining operations are conducted on 40 levels between the 1,450-foot level and the 8,000-foot level. Levels of the mine occur at 150-foot intervals. To reach the lower levels of the mine, underground shafts, or winzes as they're called, access mine levels from the 4,850-foot level to the 8,000-foot level. In recent years, Homestake has developed a ramp system that allows the passage of rubber-tired, diesel-powered equipment from level to level. Equipment can be driven on inclines and declines, which lie on 18 to 20 percent grades. There's something very special about Spearfish Canyon. It's one of those scenic splendors of America that you can really feel a part of. Massive 1,000 foot limestone cliffs, an ice cold mountain stream rushing endlessly over the rocks, waterfalls that cascade over cliffs 60 million years old. There's a wide variety of trees and a profusion of flowers. The colors in the canyon change with the sun and the clouds. The lush green of a warm summer turns to the cold and snow during the dead winter. This program offers a relaxed, unique look at Spearfish Canyon while we share the area's fascinating history. It doesn't matter if this is your first visit to D.C. Booth Historic National Fish Hatchery or if you've been a regular over the years, there's something relaxing about the quiet landscape. Even in the winter, the snow turns the area into a wonderland, but when the snow gives way to the warmth of summer, D.C. Booth takes on a new lush appearance. Few people realize the role that the D.C. Booth Historic Fish Hatchery played in the pioneering of trout management in the western United States or the interesting role it plays today for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 